All right. Open your Bibles, and uh, we're going to be in the book of Acts, and uh, we're in Acts chapter number 23, as we've been studying through this book. Um, we have made our way to Acts 23, and just so that we know where we are, the Apostle Paul has completed his third missionary journey. He comes to Jerusalem. They are persecuting him. When I say they, uh, that is the Jewish people are persecuting him. He is rescued uh, by the Romans. Uh, he's then brought again before uh, the people, and he is now going uh, to give a defense uh, before the Sanhedrin. Uh, this word Sanhedrin, uh, this means a council, and typically 70 or 71 uh, elders in this group. There are Pharisees, Sadducees, those of the priestly uh, line, the high priest, and the previous or retired high priests, if you would. And so uh, he is now going to stand before them, and he's going to give a defense once more. Uh, I, uh, the defense that he gives to the Romans was really based on his Roman citizenship. And you need to grasp this to understand what's going on in this passage. Uh, when he was speaking to the Romans, he was saying, I, I'm a Roman citizen, and therefore uh, you cannot persecute me. But now when he stands before the Jewish people, uh, these religious people, he's not going to appeal to his Roman citizenship, but he's going to appeal to his conscience. He's going to appeal to his conscience. We're going to spend quite a bit of time speaking about the conscience today, but my eye really is on verse number 11. Um, I want to get to verse 11, uh, but we have to work through this passage to be able uh, to get to verse 11. And so look to verse 1 of Acts chapter 23, and this is the Apostle Paul as he is now brought. Verse 30 said that desiring to know the real reason why he is being accused by the Jews, he that is the Roman tribune unbound him and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet, and he brought Paul down and set him before them. So here he sits in front of the Sanhedrin, a, we would say just a, a loose gathering of them, not an official meeting of the council. Now verse 1 of chapter 23, and looking intently at the council, Paul said, brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias uh, commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. And Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law, and yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? Those who stood by said, would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. And there's a whole sermon for America to listen to. Verse 6. Now, when Paul received uh, that one part were Sadducees and another Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial. When he had said this, a dissension arose among the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisee party stood up and contended sharply, We find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from among them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you've testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. My eye is on verse 11. I want to get there when the Lord stood by him and said, take courage. 
But understand to get to that point, we have to work through this passage and we need to have a look at, at the dissension. Uh, we need to have a look at, at this commotion that's going to take place. We need to have a look at the persecution and then we will see the hand of God at a very crucial point in the life of the Apostle Paul encouraging him and reaffirming uh, his commission to be the Apostle uh, to the Gentiles. So notice with me verse 1 of chapter 23, uh, Paul's declaration. Paul's declaration. Paul, looking intently at the, count, at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. What a declaration. Uh, I wonder whether you and I could say, I have lived my life to this point in all good conscience. And, and, and so I wonder whether we, we need to maybe delve a little bit deeper in in understanding what the conscience is and how the Apostle Paul can say that. I, I think we should, but before I do that, let me just make it very clear that that was the desire of the Apostle Paul. He desired that. That is something that he strived toward, not just by looking at his life, but he actually states that in the following chapter, in chapter number 24, uh, if you look at verse number 16, he's going to say this, so I always make pains to have a clear conscience towards both God and man. He says he makes great pains to have a good conscience toward God and and man. So what is this thing called the conscience? And so I, I thought it would be great to look at some uh, dictionary definitions and then to look at a scriptural definition and see how this word conscience is used. Because if, if you, uh, like I, uh, want to strive towards living in right relationship with the Lord, I believe that it is essential that we should strive toward living with a good conscience toward Him. But this word conscience, now what does this mean? And how do I do that? And, and, and why does this matter? Well, this word conscience and some dictionary uh, uh, definitions of this word, it is the sense or the consciousness of the moral goodness or the blameworthiness of one's own conduct one's own intentions or character together with a feeling of obligation to do what is right or to do what is good. Some have said it is the conscience is a cognitive process that elicits an emotion and irrational associations based on, and pay attention to this, an individual's moral philosophy or value system. It has been said it's an inner feeling or a voice viewed as acting as a guide to rightness or wrongness of one's behavior. I, I hasten to say the conscience is not the Holy Spirit. Now you need to grasp that because I've heard that before. I've heard, well, well my conscience bears witness. I need to be doing this. And, and even if that action is wrong, uh, they would say, but, but God is sh telling me through my conscience. No, listen, uh, though the, the Lord uses that, the Holy Spirit is not the conscience. Everyone has a conscience, as you will see as we look through uh, the conscience. So let me try illustrate the conscience in this way. The conscience is kind of like a thermostat. The conscience is kind of like a thermostat. Uh, and it acts according to where it's set. Wherever you set the conscience or the thermostat, that's the way it's going to act. Uh, it's a lot like a sundial. Uh, a sundial, when put out in the sun, will give you an accurate reading. But if you had to, in the dark, take a, a flashlight and shine it from the sides, you will not get an accurate reading. Uh, that uh, sign or, or that, that light, that false light, will register uh, a wrong reading. And so too with the conscience. The conscience can be wrong. Uh, some have said it's like a skylight. Uh, it, it's not like a bulb that gives light. It's like a skylight that lets light in. Uh, but if, you, uh, if that skylight is dirty, uh, or if, if it has imperfections in it, uh, it'll let through an imperfect 
amount of light. And so I hope this maybe illustrates a little bit about the conscience. So you say, hush, hush, move on to a biblical illustration, or at least to a biblical definition. I think the best biblical definition is this. The conscience is a gift from God. It is a guardian of morality, justice, and decency in the world. It is the irrefutable testimony of the existence of God. Uh, maybe you've heard this term uh, said, uh, a moral law says moral lawgiver. Uh, this is why people act in a certain way because it's written upon their hearts. I love what MacArthur had to say as he defined this. He said, the conscience is the faculty that passes moral judgment on a person's actions. Let me read that again. The conscience is the moral, fac uh, sorry, is the faculty that passes moral judgment on a person's actions. But it does so based only, pay attention church, it does so based only on the highest standard of morality and conduct perceived by that individual. So in, in other words, what he is saying here is, it is not the voice of God, it's not infallible, uh, it, it is uh, set like you would by a thermostat, by certain things. Yes, it's given by God, but it is set by experience. It is set by upbringing. It is set by one's background. Uh, an illustration would be this. A headhunter that grew up in the middle of the Amazon as a little boy uh, went out with his daddy and they went and, uh, and uh, hunted heads all day long and brought back those heads and shrunk the heads. You've all seen the stuff. Uh, I've been watching Indiana Jones too much, I guess. But that little boy's conscience has been set to this is what's right. This is what's right. And so the conscience many times can be uninformed and can be wrong. This statement is made. A conscience that is uninformed by biblical truth will not necessarily pass accurate judgment. A conscience uninformed by biblical truth will not necessarily pass accurate judgments. So Romans chapter 2 speaks of this, and so this is what you've been waiting for. Verses 14 and 15. For when Gentiles, in other words, speaking about pagans, when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they're a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. Now listen to verse 15. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness. And their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. 1 Corinthians 4.4 4. The Apostle Paul said, For I am not aware of anything against myself, uh, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. And so the conscience can be wrong. And so we live in a time uh, where we hear this statement, follow your heart. Daddy, what must I do when I grow up? Oh, sweetie, follow your heart. Or, well, we've heard it said, let your conscience be your guide. And we say, oh no, let it never be. Let the conscience never be the guide for a person. Let the heart never be that which leads the person. Why do you say that? Well, Jeremiah 17 and verse 9 says this, the heart is deceitful above all things. It's desperately sick. Who can understand it? Matthew 15, 19, this is Jesus speaking, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander, and now we say, honey, follow your heart. Let your conscience be your guide. Do you see the problem with that? Well, so what you're saying is just go against your conscience. 
No, that's what I'm saying. To go against your conscience as a believer would be to sin against your view of that which would be toward the Lordship of Christ. So let me speak about some states of the conscience. Scriptural states. On the negative side, we have what Titus 1 and verse 5 calls uh, a defiled conscience. This is a defiled conscience. Uh, to the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and the unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. What is this person with a defiled conscience? This is that person that everything becomes Unpure. I mean, you can just say something and immediately their mind goes to the gutter. That's where they run. They, their mind's always running there. They're defiled. It, 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 it doesn't matter what you say or how you say it, they're always twisted. It's always been twisted. Uh, they're defiled. Their consciences are defiled. And then the Bible speaks of a deadened conscience, or, or a different word uh, is a seared conscience. Uh, this is the, the, the thought of ironing something. And if you were to burn your hand with an iron, uh, it, it, it sears and, and it scorches, it deadens. That, so when it go, goes back, uh, it's deadened. Uh, it, it is seared. It's calloused. It's deadened. A deadened conscience. First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2 says, Through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. This is those who constantly are doing something and it becomes scar tissue. It is the no, 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 no uh, to the conscience. And that conscience becomes so deadened to that sin that it's no longer sin in their mind. I'm not saying it's no longer sin, but their conscience has been seared. Their hearts have become callous. They don't recognize that. Here's another one, keeping with the D words, a depraved conscience, a depraved conscience. Now, this is what you may call an evil conscience. This is the worst of them. Hebrews 10, says to let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts or our sprinkled clean from an evil or a depraved conscience and let our bodies Washed with a pure water. These are those that hate good and they love evil. The depraved conscience. They hate what is good and they love what is evil. The Bible speaks about that in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. It says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Who put darkness for light, light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Don't we live in that generation? Those they call evil good and good evil? A depraved conscience. On the other hand, the Bible speaks of a good conscience. This is on, on the good side, right? So this is, this is the good conscience. Uh, th this is the conscience that uh, is healthy and results out of the forgiveness of sin. And, and it is based on the atoning work of Christ. And it's based on the informing of the conscience by the word of God. Listen to this statement again. It is based on a, the forgiveness of sin, the atoning work of Christ, uh, and is informed by the word of God. Now, this is a good conscience. This is one that has been shaped uh, toward being oriented to be pleasing to God. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5 says, The aim of our charge is, that, is love that issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, a sincere faith. Timothy went on in 1 verse 19 to say, Hold, Holding faith and good conscience by rejecting this, some have shipwrecked. Their faith. Hebrews 13, 18 says, Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. 1 Peter 3, 16 says, Having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. That's a good conscience. This is the conscience that is 
been cleansed by Christ. This is a conscience that desires uh, to live in right relation to God. But the Bible also speaks of a blameless conscience. Acts 24, 16, this is the Apostle Paul when he says, I, make, I always take pains to have a clear conscience towards God and man. Really what he's saying, this is a blameless conscience. This is the living and knowing that you have not violated your conscience, that even God would point and not be, be pointing to blame, and man would not be able to point to blame. And then the last one that the Bible uses is a clear conscience. First Timothy 3 and verse 9, they must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Conscience. In other words, this is not living in outward sin, having a clear conscience, knowing that we are living to please the Lord. I'm going to stop here and ask this question. Have you heard a description this morning of your conscience? Have you heard this morning a description of your conscience? Have you heard maybe a defiled conscience? Doesn't matter what's said, what's done, your mind goes to the gutter. You're always headed in the wrong direction. Or, or maybe you're the one with the deadened conscience. You've been doing that stuff for so long, your heart has got calluses all over it, and nothing can penetrate your heart. You become callous, deadened. Or maybe you have a depraved conscience. You call evil good and good evil. Maybe you have a good conscience. You've received this through the forgiveness of Christ that took place because of the atoning work. And your conscience has been shaped by the word of God. I pray that that is your conscience. I pray that you have a blameless conscience. That you can say, even when people point fingers, there's no basis for that. Or maybe you've heard about this conscience that is a clear conscience. That you can say, as best I know, before the Lord and man, I'm in right standing. Now who knows? Only God knows the heart but as best I'm able to tell, uh, because of the forgiveness that came through the atoning work of Christ, and as I've studied the Word of God, as God, through His Holy Spirit, has applied the Word to my heart, to my life, shaped me, changed me, now I can say, my conscience is clear. My conscience is clear. This is the Apostle Paul's desire, as he declares, my conscience is is clear. Look, look at the result of this declaration. Notice uh, Ananias, Ananias's dereliction of duty. I'm, str I'm striving for D words this morning. D, dereliction. Uh, Paul's de declaration, Paul's desire, and Ananias' dereliction of duty. Instead of being one that was meeting out justice, instead of one that would truly be the high priest that would, would stand before God on behalf of man and stand before man on behalf of God, this man breaks the law and he says to someone standing near, hey, you, punch him in the mouth. Punch him in the mouth. And, and the word that is used here for to smack or to punch is the same word that is used uh, previously when we heard about how Paul was beaten by the people and was rescued by the Romans. Now, I don't believe that this was just a little backhand. No, they punched him in the mouth. And this is the reaction of a man who was derelict in his duty. I praise God when I look at this man here in verse number 2, Ananias commanding those who stood by him to strike him in the mouth. And, and I see that he is the high priest. I'm reminded that we have a high priest who can sympathize with us. That he is not like this high priest, Ananias. Our high priest has been tempted in every way as we have, but yet he never sinned. Our high priest lives forever, not to smack in the mouth, but to intercede on our behalf. 
What a contradiction. What a contradiction. Could it be even this man, Ananias, had a depraved conscience? In fact, Ananias is pretty well known in the writings of Josephus. And Josephus was a historian, a Jewish historian. And he, he spoke much of Ananias, this specific high priest. Uh, this is the one who was unconscionable. Uh, this is the one that would steal from the other priests when, when money or, or gifts were given from which the priests had to live. He would take it for himself. This is the one that would order for his own people to be killed. And guess what? This very Ananias is the one that the Jewish people would kill themselves during the Jewish revolt. When the Jews revolted against Rome, you know who would kill the high priest of the Jews? Not the Romans, the Jews themselves, because he was a wicked man. And he shows that in the dereliction of his duty. Now look at Paul's defiance. Look at Paul's defiance. Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. He's referring back to Ezekiel. He's referring back to Ezekiel, uh, where it was spoken of that these priests were, were like a, a, a wall that was, was decaying and falling in, but had been plastered over or painted over with whitewash. It looked so pretty, but it was decaying. It was falling apart. Very similar uh, to what was spoken of of those Pharisees who were nothing but whitewashed sepulchres. He calls him out. So this is a, and I use this word defiance for a very specific reason. Because what you need to notice here is the Apostle Paul is sinning. The Apostle Paul is sinning. Oh, how could it be? Listen, this is not a sinless man. We only know one who's sinless. And his name is Jesus. And notice what he's doing by his action, saying, God will strike you. Some would say, well, Paul, why don't you keep quiet like Jesus did when he was reviled that he didn't even open his mouth? Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? Yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? Now, verse 4. Those who stood by said, and now they're going to quote the law, would you revile God's high priest? Now Paul is going to say, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, for it is written. Now, he's going to quote what the law was. And he's not quoting from, uh, from Scripture. He's just quoting the law. You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So even here in his defiance, I've got three words. Uh, firstly, his indignation. He was indignant. How dare you? But then he claims his ignorance. He claims his ignorance. And he says, well, I'm sorry, I, I, I did not know that this was the high priest. And some would say, well, how didn't he know? Surely uh, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Just 20 years previous to this, uh, he was uh, part of that group. Surely he knew. Well, that's one argument. Another argument is that, well, Paul didn't see well. And they build that on uh, some of the writings of Paul where he says, see what large letters I write with. I write with my own hand that he couldn't see well, so he didn't know who he was. I, I don't know that any of those are true. I do know this, that Paul was struck, and he did not know there was the high priest. And he lashed out of, to him in defiance. But what matters is his action after he is convicted. And it says the following. I did not bro know, brothers, that he was the high priest. It's written, you shall not speak evil of the ruler of your people. This is called repentance. This is called the recognition of guilt and saying, I'm sorry. It's done. Notice what happens now. I love what Paul does. Paul's defense, verse 6. Now... When Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and others uh, and the other were Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It's with respect to the hope and the, of the resurrection and the dead that I'm on trial. And you'd say, but why is it that he goes here? What is the importance of recognizing these two groups? 
Well, what he's saying is this. There are those who are the Pharisees. Uh, they are what we might call the conservatives of the day. Uh, they are the ones that believe in an in, in a, a, a afterworld. They believe that there's going to be the ultimate resurrection of the dead. Uh, they are the ones that believe that there are angels. They believe that there are spirits. Uh, they are the ones that, in fact, uh, affirm the whole Old Testament. But the Sadducees, not so much. Uh, my children taught me this. They learned it at summer camp. The Sadducees were sad, you see. Thank you to our summer camp staff. Uh, for teaching our children that. They were sad, you see, because there was going to be no resurrection, no hope, no afterlife. Th they would be the liberals of today. They would, in fact, be uh, what I would call the atheists of today. They would just say this, there's no afterlife. Live, and that's the end. It's just, there is no uh, afterlife from here. The Apostle Paul recognizes these two groups. And, and he says, oh, just by the way, it would be interesting to note as you go through uh, the Bible that uh, there's only spoken of Pharisees that are saved, guys like Nicodemus, uh, but you never hear of a Sadducee that's saved. I just found that to be interesting. Take that. For, that was for free, by the way. You can just have that one, put it in your back pocket, and can it, and sit on the can. Um, sorry, I, I, I digress. But he says here that uh, these Pharisees uh, and the Sadducees, there was a great dissension, and this was base, the basis of this dissension. And this was his defense. Uh, the hope and the resurrection of the dead. Now, now, clearly the Pharisees did not recognize it in the same way as Christians do. We believe that there's going to be a day of the resurrection of the dead. We know that. We know of specific times, in fact, when that happens. We know at least of the, the time of the rapture of the church, when the dead will rise and they will meet with their, their spirits in the sky. And we know there's going to be a day when, when before the great white throne that the Hades and death will give up its dead and they will come to stand before the great white throne before they cast into the lake of fire. Come on Wednesday night, that's what I'll be preaching on, the the great white throne. And so, obviously, these Pharisees didn't believe in the same way as the Apostle Paul did, but they did have an understanding of the resurrection, and more so, I believe, the Apostle Paul, when he uses this with respect to hope and the resurrection, Paul constantly would affirm that his only hope was Christ. It's because of Christ that he's being persecuted not because of his bad attitude or his faulty thoughts. So verse, verse 8 now goes on to explain what I said. For the Sadducees say there's no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit. Well, the Pharisees acknowledge them all. As a side note, the Pharisees only accepted the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Other than that, they disregarded the rest of the Bible. And so notice what happens Verse 9 says, Then great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up, and they contended sharply. We find nothing wrong with this man. I like that. This is God's intervention. What if a spirit or angel spoke to him? When the dissension became so violent, the tribune, uh, so this is Claudius, uh, th this is the Chiliarch, or the, the commander of thousands, uh, he, he, he was afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them and he commands the soldiers to go down, take him away from among them by force and bring him into the barracks. And so again we see the sovereignty of God on display in this man's life. How God is going to use things. And now this man is in a position not knowing what's going to happen. He's waiting to see what's going to take place. And it's here that I'm I'm so glad to be in verse 11. Notice Paul's deliverer. Paul's deliverer. Huh. I love that song that says, we serve an on-time God. Never late, always on time. And it's here in this difficult time, verse 11 says, the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, take courage. 
For as you've testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. Notice first and foremost, uh, as I look at just some of these words, uh, as the Lord comes to him. Firstly, uh, he comes to him as a comforter. And then he, comes to, then he comes also as a commissioner. Notice the comforter. Here it is. Uh, verse number 11. The following night, the Lord. Don't go any further. The Lord. Not a Lord, not an angel, and not someone else that was sent, and not a brother in Christ, not a sister in Christ, not one who was sent by the church, but the Lord, and the word kurios is used here, the master, the owner, the one who holds all things in his possession and exercises authority over them. That same one, the Lord, came and stood next to him. What an amazing thing that God did not send an angel, God did not send another man, but the Lord himself intervened. This is a great comfort for us to know. That our God is not just transcendent, but he's also very imminent. Our God is not just seated on high where he proclaims that the heavens are his throne and the earth is his footstool, but he is also very near. Um, immediately I think of that little illustration of that young man who was asked whether his God is a great God or a small God. And his response would be, my God is so great that the heavens of heavens cannot contain him, yet so small he can come live in my lowly heart. This is a personal God. Notice the person of the comforter. This is the Lord this is the one that the Apostle Paul would write to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, when it said, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Father of mercies. He is the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with a comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. Let's be very clear this morning that as we suffer for Christ, so too it is He who comforts us. As we are abundantly suffering for Christ, so we are abundantly comforted by Him. I pray that the personal presence of the Almighty God through the person of Christ might be a great encouragement to you today. But not only the person, the Lord, but look at the position that He took the Lord stood. The Lord stood. Oh, I, I like that. You know, when, when last I heard about the Lord standing, you remember this. Uh, so here is this man, and his name is Stephen. And Stephen is being uh, stoned. And, and as he's being stoned, and uh, he goes, falls on his knees. And, and as he's dying, he looks up. And the Word tells us in, in Acts chapter 7 uh, that as he looks up, he sees the heavens open, and he sees standing, pay attention to that Word, standing at the right hand of the Father, the Son. In the time of Stephen's persecution, he sees the Lord standing. I always, when I read that, I always think, and listen, I've got no biblical basis for this, so this is Anton neology, not theology. The Lord is clapping hands. Well done. Keep on, Stephen. Could it be he comes right next to Paul? Doesn't sit down defeated, but he stands victoriously. And he says, take courage. Don't be afraid. Be comforted. I'm here. It's going to be okay. Whew, I need that. Don't you? I need that desperately. I need that voice of the Lord that says, it's going to be okay. Take courage. I saw the Lord he says, and the Lord stood, not only his position of standing, but notice his proximity. He stood by him. <laughs> Didn't stand afar and say, you're going to be okay out there. 
No, no, the Lord Himself personally. The Lord uh, Himself positionally standing. The Lord Himself in proximity by Him. And the, the, the picture that we have here is the same when Jesus said, I'm going to send another comforter or a, a, another encourager. And the word is parakletos. And to para means alongside. One who will come alongside. And it's almost the idea that we get in this picture. It's as if the Lord comes alongside the Apostle Paul and picks him up and holds him. And not only through his proximity encourages him, but with his proclamation, take courage. You hear that proclamation? Take courage. You may say, but how in the world can he take courage? Don't you understand uh, that, that this man is being persecuted by his own people? The church is unhappy with him because there's a dissension. The Jews are unhappy with him because he's a deserter. And the Romans are unhappy with him because they don't know why. That's why they keep bringing him before these councils to try and find out what's going on here. Lakeland Baptist Church, if ever you are persecuted for the cause of Christ, take courage. There's a personal God who takes the position of authority, takes the proximity of standing by you, and he proclaims, take courage. Believer, young boy, young girl, you stand for Jesus, you be persecuted, I want you to know, he says, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. He is the God that will stand by you when everybody else runs. He is that God that I was speaking about at the funeral on Thursday, the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Now notice, not only a comforter, but also a commissioner. A commissioner. Take courage, he said. For as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. Commissioning. Just renewing the commission. Is this a new commission? No, this is an old commission. You remember when Ananias went and prayed over him, and God said to Ananias, you go and, and, and you pray over him, because he's my chosen vessel to the Gentiles, and I will show him how much he will suffer for my cause. You all remember that, don't you? This is not a new commission by any means. This is a reaffirmation. This is an encouragement to say, hey, Paul, I'm not done with you yet. Don't get in the doldrums. Don't get down. Don't be discouraged. I'm not done with you yet. I had a professor in seminary that would always say to me, uh, the, the believer in the center of the will of God is immortal. Huh. As long as you're in the center of God's will, doing God's work for God's purpose, you're immortal. The problem comes when we step out. So how do we stay in that position where, where we can experience the presence of God, where we can experience the comfort of God, where we can walk in the commission of God? I'm glad you asked. Verse 1. Brothers, I've lived my life before God in all good conscience to this day. Let us live before the Lord with a good conscience. May we strive to always be pleasing to God. There's a song that comes on the radio that says, God's not done yet. He's not. He's not. Be encouraged today that the Lord who comforts you is the same Lord that commissions you. He is the one who says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. Baptize them. And then that passage goes on to say, and lo, I am with you always. A church on mission for Christ. 
a family on mission for Christ. You may feel like the Daniel in the lion's den. You may feel like the Shadrach, Meshach, or even the Ab Abednego who was thrown into the fiery furnace. You might, might feel like the Peter and the Silas who's thrown into a prison. You may feel like John and Peter who were brought uh, before the uh, rulers and told not to speak about Jesus. And it's the same Jesus that will say this to you. Listen to me, church. You decide whether it's right to obey God or to obey man. When you choose to obey God, you can live with a clear conscience. Amen? Let me close in prayer. Father, I'm humbled before you again to know that you have called us into your presence, to know that you've purchased us with the precious blood of your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, my desire is to be pleasing to you. And God, in my, my own weakness and in my own flesh and my limited abilities, God, I, I'm incapable of living a life that is fully focused upon you, a life that is fully devoted to you, a life that is surrendered to you. God, I am absolutely incapable, but I am so thankful that you are the God that's more than able. And so, Lord, I pray that you would have your will and your way in my life. Lord, I pray for my brothers and my sisters in this room. And Lord, I plead on their behalf that you would be the victorious almighty God in their lives, that they might know that victory that comes by walking in your spirit, that victory that comes from being sensitive to your leading. And Lord God, I pray that you, through your spirit, would enable us, empower us God, that we might be able to surrender completely to you. God, may there, it never be said that we withheld anything from you. Lord, today I again am a fresh, uh, freshly encouraged by your very presence. That you have said you'll never leave us nor forsake us. And that you are the God that does not watch from afar. But you're the God who is personally involved, sovereignly in control. Have your way, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen.